So go ahead and start back up. And I am going to attempt to use my video. I have no idea whether it's working, but um, but uh, I will try it and we'll see what happens. And there were a few questions I saw that um, I'm going to try to answer and then I'm gonna talk about working with the hindrances. So let's see, um, Amy asked me to do uh, just another short demo of the, um, of the counting with the breathing. So basically you're going in, out. You're not saying these to yourself, but you're breathing in, out, and then you just put the one right at the pause. And then in, out, two. And you go up to eight, and then back down to one, and up to eight. And um, that would be how the counting is done. Okay, I'm hearing the videos frozen, so I'll go ahead and stop that. Okay, um, what else? Let's see. And somebody, Jim, had asked about right concentration being samatha. Yes, in the Buddhist path, we have the Eightfold Path, one of which is right or wise concentration. And that really is, this is the practice that that is referring to. So that is correct. Um, let's see, Annie was saying, um, about is Samatha, where does that fall? And it is found very prominently in both the Theravadan Buddhism and um, Vajrayana, Tibetan Buddhism. It's called Shamatha, so it's spelled a little differently, but it's very prominently featured in both of those paths as well as the Hindu path. So um, uh, it's very, you know, very widely used in Eastern traditions and even shamanic and other traditions, uh, maybe even Christianity, I'm not sure, but I know in, in those traditions, it's used a lot. Uh, let's see, what else? Karen had asked about counting and anxiety, and she said she liked doing the breath and the counting, but it, she's getting a little anxious paying attention to both. And what I would suggest would be to let yourself settle with just the breath. So maybe take, you know, five minutes or even 10 just with the breath. And then you might introduce the counting. And by that point, you'd be more settled. And maybe that would be helpful. Um, Jesse asked why Samatha wasn't taught as much. And most of the Western teachers who went over to Asia when they first learned the practice, learned Vipassana, and so that's what they brought back. And um, there are other reasons, but the Samatha really, if you look at what the Buddha said, he, was, he talked about it constantly. And so it is now really being reintroduced into, um, into the path as a more mainstream part of it. Let's see. And so Jane asked about, Jane was saying her concentration was reduced, that she had reduced ability like I was talking about. Um, and so I am gonna talk now about the hindrances. And um, so the hindrances are basically what takes you off of your meditation object. And in any, any practice, this is going to happen. It's not, you're not doing it wrong if that happens. That's a normal part of things. And, um, and we come back and this is part of what gives us the capacity to turn away from distressing things or things that just aren't good for us in life is this ability to not be just compulsively attached to that. So this is what we're, um, what we're cultivating. And in Buddhism, there are five hindrances. And those are desire, uh, aversion. The third one I love is sloth and torpor. <laughs> I always love that. It's kind of quaint and old fashioned. Um, the third is restlessness and, or remorse. And the last is doubt. So desire is when we're meditating and then, or just in life and we're, we're wanting something and we're finding that maybe we're suffering a little bit because we don't have it or it's taking us, taking us out of the present moment. 
Aversion is when we want to get rid of something. There's something unpleasant. So it could be anger, um, hatred, even fear is in the aversion category. Sloth and torpor is sleepiness. And, um, and well, you know, it's common. I'll talk in a minute about what to do about sleepiness, but it's very common today because so many people are survived. Restlessness is, is when we're just, we're agitated or maybe we're, you know, we're like consumed with regret. It could be a physical agitation or mental. And then doubt is doubt about ourselves and our capacity to do the practice, could be doubt in the teachings, could be doubt in the teacher. So what's great about the hindrances is we can actually notice that it's a hindrance. And that in itself is helping us to not be so identified with it. So this gives us just a little bit of space from it and that kind of can help to break the compulsiveness of it. So the way we work then with these hindrances in the Samatha practice is the main, the sort of first thing we do is could just come back to the breath. If you notice it, you just come back. And if you want to notice what the pattern was like planning, you know, you could just notice or, or fantasizing or um, ruminating or, um, you know, there's a million and we, we each have our, our top 10 that you find you do over and over again. So, you, you know, we get to know what ours are and, and it's good to be aware of that because again, these are running under the surface all the time. It might be aversion, like something's bugging us that is happening or um, anxiety, worrying. Um, so these are all examples. So when that happens, you, if you can come back to the breath, you just do that. And this is building that muscle. So you think of it every time it happens, you come back, it's like doing a rep with your 10 pound weight. And we're cultivating a disinterest in a way in our, in our story and these deep, deep grooves in our consciousness. And this is the beginning of having some freedom from those. So if you find that you just can't, the hindrance is so in your face that you can't come back to the breath, then you would use a little bit of investigation into it. And this is where the Vipassana comes in. For those of you who know that, you don't need to know Vipassana. Basically, we're just, if it's there and it's right in our face and we can't come back to the breath because it's so in our face, then we are a little bit curious about it. We investigate it a little bit and we see if it can loosen up, open up. And um, then when it does, then we come back to the breath. So this is how we work with the hindrances. And, um, and we can find that sleepiness is one of the main hindrances. So if sleepiness in particular comes up, one of the things we could do is stand up and um, that will, I guarantee you won't fall asleep if you stand up. Um, you could open your eyes a little bit and let some light in. Um, you could make your posture a little bit more alert or make your effort a little bit stronger. So those are things you can do if you find you're getting sleepy. And there is a particular thing that can happen with concentration practices that's called sinking mind. And this is actually part of Buddhism. I didn't make it up. And um, sinking mind is when our concentration is stronger than our level of energy. So what it feels like, it feels like you're not thinking very much, but it's like, kind of cloudy and floaty, a little bit, you know, um, dull, a little dull. It's pleasant. It's very pleasant. So I, I've actually heard, like, in the old days when I would listen to the radio and things, there would be people who were teaching meditation who were um, actually trying to get people into sinking mind because it is kind of pleasant. The thing is, there isn't 
you're not really in the present moment with it. So if that happens to you and it feels like a sinking, you know, it's, it's pleasant and there's not thought. So you can take that as a good sign of concentration. That's the good news. But we just bring a little bit more energy. All of the things I just said about sleepiness can be used to offset sinking mind. And the opposite of sinking mind is when our energy is higher than our concentration. And that is called rising mind, which probably 100% of us are familiar with where we're, the thoughts are pulling us off more. And that is what is, you know, kind of not working so well. And that's where we need to increase our concentration. So these are some, you know, some really basic practical tips for working with, um, with the hindrances. So I will go now and take a look and see if there are questions. Let's see. Debbie saying that when she did the number at the end of the exhale, it felt very freeing and it was relaxing. That's good. I'm glad to see that. Yeah, so, so Laura is saying that if samatha is about concentration and vipassana is more about mindfulness, what about other practices? Yeah, so there are heart-based practices, and those are wonderful practices. In Buddhism, they're called the Brahma Viharas, but that means divine, the divine abodes of the heart. And there's four of those practices, and those are loving kindness empathetic joy, compassion, and equanimity. And they're, they're beautiful practices. And um, if you're interested in them, there's a wonderful book by Sharon Salzberg called Loving Kindness that is about these practices. And I also have talks on Dharma Seed that are for free about those practices. What else? Zen Buddhism. Yeah, so Jesse's asking about Zen. Zen has some different things. Zen is, can be like Samatha. There's the Shikantaza in Zen, which is an open monitoring practice, which is more like Vipassana. Um, and Zen also, a lot of Zen it can be very concentration oriented. And they also have koans. So there are some similarities with Zen, but also a lot of differences. Okay, and Anna is asking for the list of the hindrances. So I'll go back through those. Desire, aversion, sloth and torpor, or you could just say sleepiness, restlessness, and doubt. What else? Hawkeye is asking if there's a difference between samadhi and samatha. Yes, good question there. Yeah, so samadhi is also a Pali word that means concentration. So that if that's all it means is concentration. Samatha is really a whole like section of the path that and the word samatha refers to both concentration and serenity so it's really important not to forget the serenity part and, but it also refers to this whole section of the path in theravadan buddhism that includes 40 different objects so the breath isn't the only one the practices i just mentioned the heart practices are part of the samatha path so samatha is much broader than samadhi. Let's see. Um, is it tingling? So Ethan's asking, is a tingling sensation a sign you're experiencing sinking mind? No, tingling could mean that you're, um, you're it, if it's kind of blissful, it could mean that you're, you know, you're having um, some of the, you know, slightly blissful sensations arising. Um, it could mean that you're hyperventilating. So that, you know, I'll just put that out there if you're breathing too much. Um, but I wouldn't say that's really part of sinking mind. Let's see, let me just glance through what's left here. Um, 
Can I clarify the differences between Samatha and Vipassana? Yes, that is kind of important because those are two of the, of the main um, practices that are out there within Theravadan Buddhism. Samatha is a concentration practice. So in the neuroscience, it's in the category of focused attention. And what we're, what we're doing in that is really bringing the mind stream together. And we're, we're becoming less interested in our story and all the ways that we just go over and over and over our story in the mind. And we um, run over those neural pathways that many of which are, are causing suffering. We're, we're turning away and we're cultivating a disinterest in that. When you go deeper into the Samatha practice, we're really turning towards that mystery of existence. And it's possible when the awareness gets laser-like to really penetrate into some of that. With Vipassana, we're ultimately, Vipassana has the breath as part of it, but it also includes sound and body sensations, emotions, identifying the thoughts, all kinds of things. Really anything that arises in our awareness is potentially an object in Vipassana. So what Vipassana is doing is cultivating our ability to be with things as they are without getting into desire when it's positive, without getting into aversion when it's not so pleasant, and without getting bored when it's neutral. So Vipassana is allowing, you know, cult, it's building that muscle of being able to be with life circumstances and the ebbs and flows of life and have equanimity with that. Let's see, what else? Um, Jim is asking about, could I speak about non-duality in Samatha? Yeah, Samatha has a possibility of progressing to deeper experiences. And this would be on retreat. This wouldn't be in daily practice. But um, Samatha has a, pot, a potentiality in it called of something arising called jhanas, J-H-A-N-A-S. And those are meditative absorptions where the mind stream, where basically the ego self goes dormant temporarily and non-duality arises. So what is non-duality? That means that the, the me is dormant and the sense of a subject and an object. So like me and the breath the me goes dormant. And so the duality between me and the breath collapses and we're free basically of the, of the ego self when that happens. And that is a non-dual state. So it's a, an absorption into the jhana. And so we're, we're still aware, we're conscious, we're aware of the breath and a few other things, but it's very purifying for our consciousness. And how this is different than other kinds of non-duality because non-duality can arise doing lots of different practices or it can even arise spontaneously sometimes. What's different is that with the Samatha, it's induced by concentration. So it's stable. And that is part of why the Buddha, I think, recommended it so strongly because it was a way for that to happen that is stable. Let's see. Um, I'm just looking through some of the other questions. Is the sound of the breath or the feeling of the breath? It's, it's more the feeling of it. This isn't a sound meditation, the actual breath. So the technical instruction is to know the breath as it's passing the anapana spot or region. So to know the breath, I could imagine how one might think, well, I'm knowing it from the sound, but we really want to know it directly through the sensation of the skin or through knowing the breath directly. Let's see. Um,
Jed is asking um, about Samatha and open awareness. So yes, that's a good question. Samatha is a focused attention practice. So if you wanted to practice that like off the cushion, you could do it, just notice the breath while you're waiting in a line or at a stoplight in a meeting, you know, nobody might notice if you're just doing it really, you can do it with your eyes open too. And it's a focused attention practice. Open monitoring practices like Vipassana, off the cushion, you might feel your body sensations or, you know, being really mindful of what's happening as you're walking around. So both of them are good to do off the cushion and um, it's both skillful. So it really depends. I really suggest that people undertake a period of time to do a practice. Like if you want to do Samatha, I mean, you can do whatever you want. You can skip around to different practices every day. But I think to really deepen, it's good to undertake a practice for a week or a month or longer, whether that's Samatha or Vipassana or a heart practice or other things to give it a sense, chance to really land and deepen. To me, that makes the most sense because it's hard for a practice to really land or deepen if we're, we're just constantly skipping around. So that would be my, my suggestion there. 